the original set. Hello, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and uh, cut that short. Welcome to the stream. Uh, this is MRBC, Season 6, Week 2, Isengrim vs. Blackthorns Dragoons. Should be a very interesting match. I am BanditB17 from the Marine Mechs, and my co-streamer here is MDM0 from the hey, Marine guys. Mechs as well. Uh, hopefully you guys caught our last shoutcast. Uh, we casted uh, Smoke Jays versus Sig last week Sunday. There is a VOD up if you guys want to go back and watch that. It was a very good match. Uh, very fun to cast. Yeah, um, absolutely. Tough couple technical difficulties, but uh, hopefully we don't have any of those tonight. If the uh, the PGI gods look favor favorably upon us. And... Uh, should be a good matchup here, Isengrim versus Blackthorns Dragoons. Um, just uh, to get this out of the way, we do have some giveaways today. We did not have that last week. PGI has given us some codes for uh, premium time and a mech bay. So hopefully uh, we can get some winners tonight. Uh, we'll explain how that works later on as we get closer. But uh, yeah, Isengrim, Blackthorns Dragoons. Uh, what do you think about this one, MD? I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I uh, was thinking about this the other day. It, it seems like not too long ago that we were talking about two teams that really were not necessarily involved in competitive play. I think both these teams have been, uh, shall we say, fast risers through the, the competitive fields. Uh, I think um, Isengrim, this is what, their second season in MRBC? I believe so. Uh, and and they've moved up now to Division C. Uh, I be honest, I don't remember if Blackthorns Dragoons has done MRB. I think they have. Yeah, they have. Actually, uh, that was have. kind of uh, one of the interesting things, is they were in Division D, I believe. Yep. It was either D or yeah, E. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I think with you're right. Isengrim, uh, and they were both uh, doing very well in their division. Isengrim took first place, and BTD took second, but it was very close looking at their scores. So uh, this is kind of a rematch here uh, in Division C now. Yeah, and, and I like the fact that they're two, uh, shall we say, newer, maybe less experienced competitive teams that are showing promise, showing moving up through the ranks. And uh, it's kind of exciting because that's how MRBC is supposed to work, right? You're supposed mm -hmm. to start off kind of in lower ranks, lower rounds, get the experience, kind of get your toes wet, and move your way up through the ranks. And these are both two teams that are doing that, that are, shall we say, the MRBC way. And and mm -hmm. moving up through the ranks and and kind of becoming some uh, more well known names in the in the competitive leagues, so it's uh, should be exciting. I'm I'm interested to see, uh, especially in a Div C play. I know last week with uh, Sig and Spoke Jays and Div B, we saw um, kind of a definitely some of the more prominent uh, strategies that we're seeing, especially among top tier teams. I'm interested to see if that also applies in like for example, Div C, where I think you get a lot of competitive games where you might not have the big, big name teams involved, mm -hmm. uh, but you still get some really good action. I'm interested to see whether we see some unusual builds, some unusual strategies, maybe from some teams that are willing to try some different things out, or uh, whether we'll see kind of the familiar stuff out of maybe some unfamiliar faces. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure what to expect here. I I, I worked with Dane a lot, who is the leader of Isengrim. Uh, recently, because of our foray into NBT, uh, the guy is a little crazy. He can he can be a little unexpected. Uh, sometimes that works for him. Sometimes it doesn't. Uh, sometimes they'll do something completely off the wall just to to throw the other team off of their out of their comfort zone. Uh, but at the same time, uh, sometimes they just focus on the fundamentals and they they bring it down and just try to outplay their opponent in in every way possible without without doing anything crazy which in itself you know people come to expect the crazy from him and then when he <laughs> does a standard strat but then they do it well it actually can catch people off guard so really have no idea what to expect out of that team today uh i haven't really worked with uh blackthorns dragoons before but i can tell you that looking at the i think division e that they were in last season and how close those two teams were um 
I really am happy to see them in the same division again because in the previous format with only four teams per division, one man moves up, one man moves down. So in that case, uh, Blackthorns Dragoons would have been spending another division lower, but because of some teams not uh, re- re-upping, uh, some teams joining MRBC and being kind of skyrocketed up into higher divisions because of uh, the pilots that they bring to the table... Uh, these guys have another chance to duke it out, and we'll we'll see how how's it's gonna go. Yeah, this uh, like I said, this should be pretty good. I personally, as I as I've stated before, I like some of these lower division uh, lower division matches. I'm really anxious to see, um, you know. And personally, again, I'll I'll kind of root for the the crazy. I want to see a little uh, some different things. I'd love to see some good brawls. I feel like with the way the current meta set up. You know, you don't don't necessarily see that um, as much anymore as maybe you did at some point, and, and I'm always a big fan of that. So let's uh, let's see what these teams have to offer. Yep. Uh, so going into match one here, let me switch it back to this screen here. So, MRBC has very specific rule sets for what mechs you can bring. Uh, not necessarily what mechs, but what weight classes uh, and how many of each chassis and things like that. Uh, and the first drop is a very light tonnage drop. Four lights, four mediums, no heavies and no assaults. Uh, they can bring two of each chassis. They can bring clan mechs, uh, only th- a maximum of three clan mechs. And you'll see that throughout all five drops, all... All, f- or all five have a maximum of three clan mechs allowed, and you cannot have duplicate clan mechs whatsoever in all five drops. So you can see a lot of t- Timberwolves, Hellbringers, and Arctic Cheetah, you know, but you're not going to be seeing two Timberwolves and a Hellbringer or anything like that. So drop one, of course, uh, with the four lights, four mediums. Um, what do you what do you expect to see? We're going to be on River City for this map, and uh, we played our match obviously earlier in the week against uh, yep. Steel Jaguar. They did run a a semi ranged deck against us and did very well against us. So I would not say that ranged is off the table in this map. Uh, no, this, absolutely not. But the 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 primary difference between this and what we saw last week uh, with <laughs> HPG is. Uh, you, even though you can do range on this map, it's not impossible to reach those targets in a timely manner. In HPG, yeah. you have to go underneath them and up on the wall and try and chase them down, and it's just a nightmare to try and get that to work properly and usually take heavy losses in the process. But River City, you can close the gap, especially with a much higher uh, group um, speed max, uh, the lower time to, or higher time to kill. Uh, so it ta- you know. Four, four lights and four mediums might not be able to put out as much damage in a short amount of time as, uh, as you know, say, heavies and assaults. But at the same time... Um... Well, I think the, the thing that, uh, like you said, River City is... When you think range, maybe you think, okay, uh, if you want to run a range deck, you go back at dropship and pull it all the way back that... Where PGI extended beyond that dropship, um, or maybe you go waterside uh, or by the Citadel. But I think for a light drop, maybe for a heavier drop, you'd see a range deck on River City. I think for a light drop, you might want to go brawl, um, like you mentioned, with the maybe a little less firepower, um, a couple more range mechs that are maybe more, or a couple more light mechs that are maybe less suited to the range of the game. I mean, obviously, you've got the Ravens. Uh, you know, 2x, 4x, 3l, um, that are kind of your ranged light mech, your your standard range light mech. Outside of that, uh, you're really kind of grasping at straws, I think, trying to find a good ranged light mech. Not saying it can't be done, but I would not be surprised to see a just good old fashioned light brawl somewhere in the buildings, maybe even in the water. That would be fun to look at. Um, and and with just the speed that you have and the advantage where you can kind of sneak around the corners, maybe go through the buildings, uh, even in some of those ranged things where you can reduce the time, the exposure time, um, where, say, if you're in a, ra- a, a brawl deck going up against a range deck, if you can get on top of that that range deck quickly, mm-hmm. which in light mechs you certainly can do, um, you should have the upper hand. So I, I'm expecting a, a light brawl, and, and that will... That's always kind of fun because it really comes down to who can hit the legs best, and if we see a light, and who brawl can focus? Water, it has to yeah. be a good focus. 
Absolutely. Good focus and, and on the legs. If we see a light bra on the water, that adds that extra, you know, you lose the visibility on the legs. Can they find, for example, uh, the hips, which also count usually on mechs as a leg hip box, uh, but it's a little easier to hit, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, and even just having some of that damage reduction firing into the water itself, it should be uh, pretty interesting. So that's what I'm pulling for. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I was the drop commander, I probably would avoid that for those reasons. But, you know, I'm not the commander. I'm just a spectator. So I'd like to see something uh, nice and fun. But if I were them, I'd probably try and maybe stick to the buildings uh, or maybe even go up to dropship and do a light brawl out in the open uh, without any sort of buildings to get in your way to accidentally, you know, uh, get yourself stuck behind a building when your team needs you sort of thing. So that might be what what will probably, or I should say probably, that could be one thing that happens. But, uh, you know, it's tough to say, especially on this, with this light mechs, with the faster mechs, to really predict what both teams are going to do. Yep, and you should have your lobby invite here in a second. So they are in lobby, and they are forming up, so we should be uh, getting started pretty soon here, which is exciting. Um, once again, uh, this is our second shoutcast, so we are always open to any feedback from the community. I thought that the amount of positive feedback that we had last week was overwhelming, actually. I was, I was really excited uh, how much you guys seemed to like it, so I hope that we can... Um, continue to uh, offer that to you guys uh, going forward and and provide you guys a good show here. So, looks like we might be getting started any minute now. Today's drink of choice, once again in my fancy schmancy mug, we are going straight Crown Royal Apple and Ice. And Cheers. I've got water. Go Hokies. Did you have water last week? Oh, and um, nobody spoil the Packer game for me, please. Uh, Packers versus Broncos right now. I am a diehard Packer fan. So. Oh, and would you look at that? The Packers are... Oh, sorry, I'll keep it quiet. Douche, baby. <laughs> <laughs> uh... And Kevin guessed with the most important question in the evening so far. How many matches are we going to miss tonight due to Bandit's connection? What? Uh, <laughs> uh, hopefully not. Whether, I, uh... I emergency rebooted my modem, my router, kicked my wife off the Wi-Fi, took every other computer off of the network, restarted my computer. Good God, I hope we have no problems. Otherwise, I'm going to be buying a new computer. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> He's been saying nice things to Russ all week, so yeah. And uh, uh, one of the things here I'm seeing in the lobby chat, which you guys cannot see, they asked me how long is the stream delay. Stream delay is five minutes. So anything that you are hearing right now was five minutes ago for us. So it makes it a little bit difficult to interact with the audience. Uh, if there's anything that we need to touch on quickly, we'll try and do it in chat. Otherwise, uh, we will answer some of your questions in voice, but you won't hear the answer for five minutes. Uh, and then we will be doing the giveaways in chat using Mubot. So hopefully that'll go smoothly. Just waiting on the both teams to ready up, and then we will be heading into drop one of season six, week two. Isengrim versus Blackthorns Dragoons. So, how are the Packers doing? <laughs> well, let's take a look here, and the answer is not good. Yeah, not good. How much do you want to bet that uh, Mech the Dane is going to be in a Nova on this one? I don't think I want to take that bet, because I would probably put $100 that it's a small pulse Nova. I would not be surprised. Although he could do like uh, you know his PPC jump Nova if they're doing a range deck. I don't know. They are doing a range deck. That would be, but that would be very tough to pull off. I think. But I think we can both agree that like there will that. be a Nova on this, and Dane will be in it because that is kind of his trademark. Yeah. 
I I would not be surprised what's whatsoever. After all he went through in MBT to get a Nova, I think <laughs> it's um, I think it's pretty well known that that's a very popular mech uh, for Dane. I should say. Yep. Cool. I think uh, I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna give away our first premium time code after drop one is completed. So we'll be doing a little bit of the uh, the post game and stuff like that. But during that. Um, I will try to time it where I announce it here first, and then maybe five minutes later I'll actually punch it into chat, uh, so you guys will have a little bit of a warning. The way that it works is uh, you'll do exclamation point raffle to enter once the ra or once it's open. So it's not yeah, choosing not people now. around. You actually have to participate. But all right, well, it looks to me like we are getting started, so I'm going to head into the game. Gonna grab my trusty dusty PlayStation 4 controller that I borrowed from a friend because I do not like consoles. But now I'm forced to use the console controller to uh, try and bring quality camera movements. Alright, hit all those fancy dancy buttons that I have to hit. Oh boy, somebody screwed up. They yep. dropped in Conquest, so that's going to end up being an immediate right. redrop. <laughs> Good start uh, on that one. I guess we can watch some pretty cool jump Is ship action or drop, drop ship. Here? Yeah, yeah. I wonder if they're different colors. Do we have a confirmation on whether these are painted different colors? They're all the same. Who knows? What's the name? Might as well get some research in here. Space bar. There we go. I got to remember all the nice fun keys. Hopefully they realize pretty quick here that uh, this is certainly a misdrop, and looks to me like this guy right here is saying to himself, "What the hell? Somebody screwed up." If they play this out, I, I will be, I will actually be kind of surprised because they will be giving each other's decks up pretty solidly. Looks like they've realized it as we're getting some uh, team killing fire action. Okay, here. all right, there we go. So yep. good start to the night. Uh, we already have our first misdrop. Uh, that must have been a little bit of an oversight there, but uh, I think that just goes to show that these two teams are anxious to get started and are looking for uh, for blood here, so hopefully that is a good sign of uh, what's to come, <laughs> but we will see how that goes. I'm going to go ahead and uh, not show that screen, even though they can both see yep. it. And uh, pop back to this until they are ready to launch again, which should be relatively quick. Well, at least that was. Uh, Hopefully, they have drop fast difficulties, but. <laughs> but. Drink for every time they do a misdrop. Let's do it. I, I don't have any comment to that, Bandit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't look. So, this... I, I don't know if you looked, but I didn't even look really at... at uh, I, didn't I didn't really pay attention outs. to the mechs or anything, actually. Yep. I, that almost looked like a gargoyle I was behind. What the hell was I even looking at? I don't even know. I wasn't even paying attention. So, hopefully that means it'll be exciting, because I'll be surprised with when I see stuff, but uh, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> Alright, we're getting right back into it, guys. Alright, see if we can get this right. Well, the game mode is right this time. We are on Skirmish, River City. The map is correct. Excellent. It and is now a different time of day, however. Night time. Yeah. Yes. Hit that button. That button. I think that's all of them. Take oh, a look at some of the loadouts me. here. Seeing a lot of small pulse. You know what? This is actually, it looks like, I'm taking a look at Eisen's loadout here. I see a lot of small pulse and then some range builds here. Interesting got combination, yeah. drop going on right now. Um, I'm seeing some Raven 4Xs. Uh, yeah, that is yeah. that is an interesting mix drop. Ravens are running the, uh, 
Raven 4X are actually running two ER larges on them. And uh, I've got an Enforcer with large lasers, a Wolverine 6K with the three ER large, two medium lasers, and uh, looks like a Shadow Cat with clan ER large lasers. They are definitely ranged, and they are moving into the water. Their Storm Crow is three ranged, um, and that is Dane in the Storm Crow, so I'm glad that no one took me up on that bet. And once again, blue is... Uh... Isengrim and red is BTD. Uh, BTD has moved up into Upper City, and it looks like they are setting up for just to get some information BTD at this point. Has some some ranged mechs as well, and them not as many though. They seem to have. Uh, kind I of saw a the mix Wolverine six K in there. Uh, is he running six K? But their Stormcrow Prime is actually a full small pulse laser build. That's uh, interesting a little, uh, combination a there. More of a brawl. Now, is that Blackjack 1X, is that uh, running lots of medium lasers and stuff like that? Yeah, that's a medium laser. Uh, yeah, it's the medium lasers and then medium pulse, what's that, uh, six medium lasers. That is a pretty so is... brutal build. Now, that thing has an XL engine in it, yeah. so it's extremely vulnerable, but that's not that bad considering that most people do te typically go uh, with uh, shooting at legs in this, uh, in this brawl. So that might not work against them, but we'll see if Isengrim takes advantage of that XL engine. So there's some initial shots fired on the spiders, which are moving around trying to get some information yeah, think... from uh, Isengrim, who is currently posted up behind the boat, which is something that I believe you called at the beginning of the match, is that it, that was a viable strat that might we might see here. Yeah, it looks like uh, Isengrim's pretty content to kind of stick in the water there, uh, and Blackthorn's Dragoons have gone high ground. The interesting thing, when you compare these two teams, they've both got a mix of what appears to be brawl and range. Isengrim's definitely a little heavier on the range side. and uh, They even went with the Firestarter S as medium pulse, so that yeah. even has a little bit of reach uh, more so than a typical Firestarter A, which they do have one of those as well, so this is a very mixed build. Yeah, and uh, Blackthorn Dragoons are are a little a little more I think that Stormcrow being small pulse might be interesting to see if they can get within uh, closing distance of Isengrim I think that gives them the advantage but they're going to have a hard time I think approaching them although you know what right now with where Isengrim is sitting uh, it leaves them a nice escape route into the water mm -hmm. but they need to make sure that they've got eyes on any approaches because they're they've got buildings as kind of cover and it looks uh, to me like Isengrim does have an Arctic Cheetah smartly uh, sitting on the left side of boat, just looking down yeah, these firing lines, making that. sure that if they do make a move, he will have that early warning, which is a good good post on his part there. In the meantime, Blackthorn Sagoons doesn't seem to be uh, very interested in trying to find a way around here. If I were them, I almost might be thinking about coming back through the spawn points um, and those mountains kind of uh, at the edge of the map and working their way... Um, the north side of the map down around into the buildings and then into uh, Isengrim's position, but right now they seem to be pretty content to kind of bleed some of the clock down. Yeah, and now I I don't I don't want to say it as if I've ever done a successful counter to this type of strat, but I would I would think that the best thing that I can think of is BTD takes it back across to Starport, um, takes it down by Citadel tries to push Isengrim back maybe they'll go back into the corner of water I think that would actually be an ideal place to put them instead of them moving up to say upper city or something like that because yep. what you can do then is you have all that additional cover with the the addition of this the new map and, and things and it is getting daytime so perhaps they're waiting for the night to go away which is is viable as well waiting out the clock just long enough so you can make your move but I would say if you could get them to start retreating to that corner, you can use all of this island and all the way up to boat as cover as you yeah. approach. I would take that over, say, rushing lower city and forcing them to the other side where you really don't have as much, That's a good point. as yeah. many options. Uh, yeah, they've to... got those sand dunes kind of in the southern side of the map by the water, but mm -hmm. that's not exactly great cover uh, if you're trying to make an approach. Exactly. It, it's a little bit of cover, but you're right. They would they would have um, probably a tougher tougher time than if they came all the way around. That's a, a very good point. And it looks like um, Isengrim has a fire starter that's kind of spreading wide uh, towards the southern end. and mm -hmm. Probably just trying to make sure that they're not doing end. any sort exactly. of uh, 
flanking maneuver or split split rush or anything yeah. like that because that is another viable strat against this kind of thing is to do a split rush in order to take away any retreat lanes so if they did rush down lower city if uh, Isengrim chose to retreat to those sand dunes if you already had somebody sitting near citadel you could you could close that distance much quicker now the guys who are initially rushing are kind of bait and that, that's a pretty rough position to be in but if you can get a couple light mechs into their mediums that lets the other guys kind of roll up on them and and with those ranged mechs closing that gap as quickly as possible is is definitely a key now some of uh, Isengrim seems to be moving up a little bit, trying to get some angles on these guys in the in the upper city. Uh, Blackthorn's Dagoons does not seem to really be uh, interested in moving too much. They've got their spider has taken 94% damage, uh, and I think he's the most damaged player in the game right now. Uh, a couple Isengrim guys at 95, 96. Looks to me like most of Isengrim is now shifting to Citadel side. Yeah, they're moving up to the Citadel. I think they're uh, they're kind of eager to get into the battle here. They yeah, and and I always give mad props to whoever's got the guts to to break the stalemate first because that typically puts you in a worse position than your opponent. Uh, so it is risky business moving up. But I think if if memory serves, they are a split deck. So. They don't. They're not necessarily in a terrible position if BTD decides to rush in at a closer range. Well, they are a split deck, but they're a little. Uh, they're a little heavier on the range, and BTD is a little heavier on the brawl. So I okay. think if they all things equal, and you're just considering the decks, which we all know is not necessarily the one true decider of things, I think that gives the edge to BTD if they can close in without taking too much damage. Um, now Isengrim, I think is is with their ranged and especially given how passive BTD is, they're trying to get um, some extra damage in. You know, they, they and they're know getting it here against one of the deck. targets. Yeah. It's very little, though. I think that's probably the spider that they were hitting down to 94% now, so that was just yeah, a flush got, one. Uh, oh, it was a, a cheetah. cheetah down, down a little bit, and they've got a spider out here in the open that just took a, uh, a nice little shot. He's at 88% now. We'll go see... Whether that's He's hiding out. behind a single rock right now, uh, and it looks to me like some of those mechs can get a shot maybe on the back ear. If they move over to the edge of Citadel, they could potentially just get that extra little shred of damage in with their large large lasers. Yeah, and this is a, a medium pulse spider. He's got uh, a little bit of orange armor, but nothing, nothing too damaged across the board. Obviously, you don't want to be taking any damage at this point in the game. But uh, looks to me like Isengrim is once again on the move, heading up towards Starport. Uh, they might be able to get an angle, especially spreading out so much. They might be able to get an angle on the spider, take away that hi hiding spot, and maybe take him down. You know, another shred of health. Let's see if they All right, can get so it. We've got uh, this is Star Wolf for Isengrim was the uh, fire starter that moved up into Starport, and he actually took some damage. I think. They might have considered the fact that uh, they might have been thinking that Blackthorns was all brawl, and they do have some ranged mechs, and he's down to 94% right now. I think he was uh, maybe a little over anxious, maybe thought that you know they're all brawl, they can't actually hit me from here, and he took a little bit of damage. So uh, I think that gives Isengrim. Hopefully, if they're communicating well, they'll now know that they have some ranged decks here, and that this might be a little more of a poke deck. Uh, but the other side of that is maybe they'll be convinced that this is actually just an all range passive deck and if Blackthorns rushes them, uh, they might be caught on surprise. I think right now neither team has really shown too much of their hand um, with the brawl mechs that they are kind of carrying in their back pocket. So it'll be interesting to see how Isengrim plays this. Clearly they want to be aggressive in, in moving up, but they've, they've now made it uh, a much closer engagement than it was before. Yeah, it looks like they're just trying to poke down, just get as much damage as you can. Because I, I would assume that once we hit maybe the, the two to three minute mark, we're going to see an all-out brawl here. I, yeah. I do not see these two teams drawing it out, especially with how aggressively Dane is, has been moving his troops, now bringing them up into D5 water. Into, I mean, yeah, they, are, the water. They, are, they, they are being very aggressive. They're being very aggressive. It's, it's a vulnerable place to put themselves in, but, you yeah, know, it's... So Dane, uh, Dane knows whether this is a brawl or not because he's moving some ranged mechs. Uh, I think he's just trying to get an angle, get some damage down, but he's moving some ranged mechs dangerously close to what is a uh, much heavier brawl than I think he suspects at this point. Um, and the other, the other side of this is that 
aside from the one spider for for Blackthorns uh, at 83 percent the rest of their team is at 98 and above I mean they are fresh I think if you got one some of these light max up close enough to kind of freak them out and make them think okay it's time to go but kept your main body back you might be able to coax them into moving and getting all of those red guys moving in sync but they are they do they have left some guys back but we are getting some fire on target now I have not seen an aggressive move from BTD yet to, to swarm over them, but you know if with. If I were BTD, you know what I would I would. There's four mechs right on the edge there, including a range stormcrow with large uh, large lasers, which is just. I mean. I think as soon as they see that medium, they're gonna call it. But yeah. they did just take a shot at them. Maybe they didn't know what it is, but they are playing. They're content with playing poke right now, and it, based on the percentages, it looks to me like Eisengrim is winning this. So the longer this goes on. If they continue up this aggressive rate of fire, they will slowly wear down the other team and and perhaps be on top once the brawl does start. Yeah, this is uh now Blackthorns is putting up a lot of UAVs. I think they really want to know whether they're uh, getting rushed or not. But at this point, I think you're right. Isengram's just going to poke them down. I mean, they've got one of the spiders down to seventy nine percent already. Yeah. This yeah, is a very to... aggressive uh, push by Dane in the Stormcrow right up the left side. We're going to have an engagement here shortly, and I here. think this yep. is going to be it. If I was BTD, I'd be moving, and it looks like they are moving yeah, right now. Uh, not as aggressively as I would think, though. They they were content they pushing up. them back down. They backed up. I can't. I I think that that's a mistake here because and that blackjack I think is the reason why he came around that corner looking for Dane, and he got knocked down to seventy six percent in that. Oh my push. goodness! Yeah, I mean that and is that is rough. rough. Back, actually, Eisengrim is putting these shots on target, but you can't go up and give up twenty percent damage like that and then back Not up. Anything out of it. Now they've got an enforcer pretty damaged. Yeah, that was that was the time to push. I think, and, mm-hmm. and it cost them that that engagement where really they. Uh, they hit Dane at a decent level, but he's at 83% right now, and now they have two more mechs at 70%. Uh, percent. That hurts. That's not a good trade by Blackthorn at all. And let's take a look at Dane's armor. I mean, he's got one weak arm. The rest of it spread very well. He did a good job spreading it, and I mean, he is right on the edge of the buildings here. It's insane seeing these ER larges with, which, yep. with such a long burn time this close to the enemy and them not trying to take advantage of that i think that if this goes eisengrim's way that's going to be the biggest uh telling point here is just the the lack of aggression from btd to try and get anything out of this those yeah, I mean, percentages point, are just swinging got, so uh, hard you got four kills four mechs sitting on the edge here within their uh basically quick push brawl range if you play this right you could have gotten gotten up four nothing and yeah, you would have had to cross open ground in, in front of ranged mechs, but uh, you know, with the, with a good play, you might have uh, might have still had the advantage just getting the early numbers down. But at this point, they're uh, I think they're being a little too passive here, and it, it seems like it's certainly going to cost them unless something really. Uh, and most of Isengrim is now up right on that border. I mean, if anything, this is the time. Only having one guy back yeah. in in D six right now, you got to do something. Yeah, they're they're just. just uh, Dane has taken a, the brunt of the damage with his aggressive peaks, though, but it is so well spread, nothing is open right now. So he is at 64, but most He's of it's center torso. torso I, feel like, it, yeah. I feel like that takes away the incentive in a brawl to go with the legs when you've been doing so much poke. And I think that that just makes it that much more difficult to, to you know, now, bring if, down targets focused. If and now it looks to me like Isengrim is going super Isengrim aggressive. They're going to make there. the brawl happen with one minute remaining. They are pushing in, and we are going to see this brawl yeah, go down. Go. Now you know they've got that blackjack. Sixty-nine percent. They are on that blackjack. He is target. down. And there he goes. Let's see if they focus anyone else down here. We've got uh, lots of hits on the cheetah. I uh, bet you the Stormcrow is going to be next. Sixty-eight percent. They've got an enforcer that's beat up. The enforcer like the are after that yep. enforcer here. The enforcer is getting and shredded he down, and he is down. That's two down for BTD. They have a spider coring out Mech the Dane in the back. Dane might go down in his Stormcrow. They that they, they do, but they're they're now switching to the uh, Blackthorn Stormcrow. That's who they're focusing, and that's a wicked build with the. Small and he ball. goes down, so that is three down with BTD. Not looking too good. Uh, Terragato and the Enforcer does go down, but not a lot of focus from BTD. They should be killing mechs a little bit quicker here. Uh, I think the Wolverine goes down, and there's four mechs left for BTD. And they are just falling down at this point. We've got uh, Firestarter below 50%. Uh, Arctic Cheetah, Firestarter's down. Arctic Cheetah looks like he's uh, 
within close range, but that's going to do it, and that is a a very painful loss, I think, in the last minute there, especially for um, you know, Blackthorns, who had a, a more brawl-oriented deck to essentially lose uh, five mechs in a, in a close brawl in the last minute. That that one will hurt. Now, unfortunately, Isengrim did not come away with the eight-kill victory here, yep. so that does hurt them in, in terms of the grand scheme of things. But still coming away with the victory, getting five mechs, it's not you know, it's not that bad. It's it's still much better than the penalty you would have gotten drawing it to a tie. So I gotta give yes. them props for being aggressive going in. Uh, uh again, props to Mech the Dane at nineteen percent in his Stormcrow, being able to keep that mech alive until the timer ran out. That is yep. impressive uh spreading damage and using his cover to to break those sci- uh, sight lines with only one leg. And, and was able to keep his mech alive to rob BTD of those precious sea bills. That extra, yeah, that extra kill. And, and uh, with another 30 seconds, I mean, Dane might have gone down, but those last three lights for, for Blackthorns were were in, in big trouble. So, uh, yeah, I think Isengrim wanted the, the eight kills. I think they'll take that victory anyway. And, and, and really, try and uh, turn that into some momentum here going into absolutely. drop two. Definitely. And really... Uh, you know that was that was really interesting to watch because I give a lot of props to to Eisengrim for being aggressive for doing that, but I can't say that uh, it was necessarily a strategy that was really conducive to the deck they were running. If again, obviously they don't know what the builds are for Blackthorns, but Blackthorns really had the deck to counter that, mm-hmm. uh, and if they had played that differently, I think they really could have uh, gotten a different result. We're watching now on the replay of the Twitch stream it was that. Uh, that sort of that failed push around the corner to get on to Mech the Dane. And that, that right there really, I think, was the turning point. If they had committed to that, if they had pushed down, even down into the water, um, they would have taken a lot of fire from the guys up at the dropship. But they very easily could have gotten a couple kills, um, gone up in kills, and then pushed right on up into the dropship. And with the decks that they had, um, I think that would have favored Blackthorn. So that was... Um, mm-hmm some interesting strategy on both parts both with Isengrim being so aggressive with the deck that maybe is not the best for aggressiveness and Blackthorns being timid with the deck that kind of was more suited towards the aggressiveness it's almost like the the roles got uh, swapped there yeah and you know I bet you that uh, even coming away with the victory I, I bet you Isengrim might be kicking themselves that they didn't go even 30 seconds sooner. I think yeah. that would have turned into, into a, a eight kill victory. Uh, they That's... decided to go exactly at the the one minute mark, and it did work for them. But they could have gotten a little bit more, and uh, I bet you that they wish they did that. Now again, for us, it's easy to say we have access to all the builds. We know what. Um... The health of all the mechs are we can look in, in one place and see that and obviously uh isengrim and blackthorns don't have access to that same information but uh yeah i think if they go back and look at the tape i think they'll definitely want to maybe push a little earlier next time but i can't blame dane uh for being maybe um not quite as aggressive as they absolutely could be even though they were being very aggressive just knowing his builds um and and kind of not knowing what they were running uh, you know, I can understand why, okay, you want to push a little earlier than that, sure. But they got the job done. Uh, they got the first win. So let's see if they can ride that momentum now that we're going into Canyon Network, which, again, this is going to be, I think, any man's game with um, what strategy we see. Mm-hmm. And I do have the instant replay out now. The, uh, the part that I am on is when... Uh, Isengrim has allocated seven mechs to the front line, leaving one back in dropship. Um, I, there, all I can say, and I I can't say that I know what was going through the mind of either team, but I would say that when you have seven mechs, which are majority ranged mechs, right on your front door like that, even when it was only four, I, I think that there, there was some missed opportunities from BTD, and they were clearly not winning the trades. They might have been making contact, but the amount of damage that they were taking in return, as we saw with the percentages, was just going heavily in favor of Isengrim. So uh, hopefully that they they can look back at this and and take this into drop two, and and just try and feel where both teams are at a little bit better to make those decisions and, and make the right calls as to when to go in. 
So we're seeing here the, the main brawl is going down, two mechs down for BTD. Uh, the other thing I was seeing, it was a lot of spread. I saw multiple um, instances where there was a couple mechs on one target, but really not a lot of focus. Yeah, it was. Um, it seemed to break down kind of into a desperate situation there at the end uh, for Blackthorns. You would certainly like to see good, clean focus, especially when you you know when you're in that push and you've got the mechs for it. Um, it just looked like they didn't uh, they didn't have a firm um, idea of what they wanted to do. They were they were very passive throughout that engagement. Hmm. Uh, and and sometimes you know you just got to commit for better or worse to a strategy and if it works it works if it doesn't it doesn't uh, but I think kind of not committing maybe hurt them more than anything it seemed like they wanted to push and then they pulled back uh, when the when the engagement did happen I think they were surprised honestly it seemed like they were surprised that Eisengrim got on top of them mm -hmm. like that and uh, so it, it, you know and obviously it's the first drop of the night uh, so both teams need to get into their competitive groove, competitive mindset. Isengrim has the momentum right now, but that doesn't mean that things can't change. They've got four more matches to go. Yep. And, you know, I was a little curious as to why one mech opted to stay back at Dropship, but I am seeing in the, the yeah. match chat here, apparently one of them got stuck permanently on terrain and was not able to get off of it. So he was in firing range of the brawl uh, because he was a long range mech so it's not like he was completely out of the fight but that that does answer my question is why why would you sit back there when you're calling a brawl why wouldn't you bring forward and apparently that is why so it's it's uh, that's definitely very interesting so that could have been a bad position for them too if uh, if the brawl decided to come to them yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that mech not being able to move that's almost one mech out of the action right off the bat so um, I did have a, a note in chat from the magician asking me to move the MRBC logo. I'm gonna have to do that for the next stream. I did not go into the code and change it yet, uh, so I will need to do that. It's essentially just changing how many pixels up or down. So I will make sure that that gets done for next stream. I apologize that you weren't able to see the timer. Um, who knew that we were gonna have some matches go down to the wire here? Uh, I figured it wouldn't be that bad, but I guess so. <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, we'll try and do a better job, I think, of getting you a sense of the time uh, if it gets to that close. Mm -hmm. I, I know uh, chat's watching with bated breath, seeing what's going to happen next, especially without the clock. And mm -hmm. maybe we just want to keep you guys on the edge of your seats. So Definitely. So um, let me, before they finish readying up, I'm going to go ahead, and I know I said I was going to say this ahead of time, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and put in... Uh, a code for premium time, one day premium time raffle into chat right now, uh, and we'll uh, see how it goes here. And I'll have this open pretty much right up until the time that they are ready, maybe just a minute. So go ahead and type exclamation point raffle, even though none of you guys will see that, um, and stuff like that. One day premium time code. So uh, next map, Canyon Network. Uh, we're rolling into a 2-4-2 two, two drop, so two lights, four mediums, and two heavies. Canyon Network. What do you think we're going to see here? You know, that's a great question. I would lean towards range. I think range is the flavor of the month. Um, longer than the month, but it's the quote-unquote flavor of the month uh, for how the current builds go, etc. It's possible to to do a brawl deck on canyon you can sneak around try and stick maybe the low ground uh not be seen or at least if you are seen just break the sight lines get the guys uh as close as possible to the enemy force with the brawl deck um, but it's definitely i think range is the way that most teams go 
Yeah, I do see that a lot, but uh, if if you can execute a brawl well enough, um, you know, I feel like you can you can make it happen here. And I lost MD. Internet connection problem. I really hope that that's not me. <laughs> You there? Please don't let this happen again. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh dear. I'll try and get that up as quickly as possible here. Doesn't look like my OBS has given up yet, so I, I hope that's a good sign here. So, I'm going to go ahead and close the raffle because it looks like we are about to get started. And it looks like R2D2 for the win has won. And I will be sending you your code as quickly as possible here. I'm actually going to do that after this match is over because I need to get casting here. So, congrats to R2D2 for the win. Make sure you follow MRBC League so you can keep up on the action. Uh, kill, co streamer webcam for now. And it looks like I will be solo casting this until I get a phone call. So, let's go ahead and switch over. Bam, 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 bam. All right, Canyon Network, here we go. Really hope the stream's holding up, because I am in-game. I mean, I don't think there's a internet connection issue. Uh, looks like we have uh, mostly, I would say, range deck with BTD. And uh, on Isengrim's side, looks like the same with Gridirons, two, two Xs. So we're going to have a lot of poking here. I'm actually going to go ahead and get in the... Uh, the space here of some of these mechs and just see how they're poking and where they're moving. Trying to get MD back. Okay, well, you're I back. Some nice technical difficulties to start off our second match. Yeah, I'm not sure if that was just on your end or my end or what, but... Um, I can't tell you. Are you in the game? I'm in the game. I'm watching. It uh, looks like Isengrim is uh, set up in the nice little firing line here. It looks to me like they're landing quite a few shots on their opponents. I'm not sure if yeah, BTD is caught off guard. I think they were a little surprised with where they with where Isengrim got. Blackthorns is set up, kind of split at the uh, big... Uh, big middle hill and the radio tower here and now they have a fire starter coming in aggressively aggressively on isengrim's flank here this is a very ballsy move uh i don't know if he's just trying to put some pressure on thinking that isengrim's in full retreat or full rotation but he's he gonna get up, but he is right shredded here this is an incredibly aggressive move and i think that is going to cost him i'm not sure why he opted to go in that heavily but uh, I don't think BTD has an answer for that lost mech. That seemed to me like that was just a straight up loss. Uh, he put up UAV, a UAV, but I don't think that that really net them much at all. He put up a UAV, and Isengrim's already rotated away. That uh, that was a very pricey UAV, and I'm not quite sure what the objective of that was, other than maybe turn them, uh, get them distracted. But Blackthorns didn't. They uh, didn't capitalize didn't on it. In, that, they yeah. didn't move in aggressively or anything like that. So it looks like uh, Isengrim just continued to rotate, trying to take away any hiding spot or any any poke spot that BTD now, had. Blackthorns has a uh, Wolverine six K that's got a cord CT. He's trying to peek around the corner here. Uh, their Thunderbolt 5SS is getting ripped That's to shreds right now. That's interesting. Yeah, he, he took a ballsy move coming through Theta, trying to jump into the ramp to just get a new angle, but that cost him quite a bit. Massive amounts of damage done to him. It looks like the whole of BTD is rotating hard right as if they were a brawler deck, and they're just not able to return fire. Isengrim is not even using their cover at this point. They're just firing as fast as their heat will allow, just putting as much damage on target as they possibly can. And they are scoring some massive yeah, hits here. This is this not is, looking uh, good for BTD whatsoever. 
Now, BTD is starting to split up here. They've got some guys dropping down, some guys staying above. That's going to really hurt because you're just minimizing the targets that uh, Isagram has to shoot at when you got some guys yep. on top and some below. Yeah, that Timberwolf is just you know getting now shredded now he's of it. yeah he, he, everybody else is out of fire but they're they're just leaving that timberwolf behind to take additional damage mech did that get caught down below costly. but he should be able to move around cover to get himself uh, out of harm's way here but two down for btd but almost every mech except for the arctic cheetah is is in critical condition here yeah. very costly move and and they're strung out right now they're not they have an enforcer that's at 61 percent who is leading the pack there and they got a Timberwolf hanging up the rear. That was that was not a good move. Isengrim now is countering by uh, backing up the ramp so they can stay engaged. They've got, uh, what is that, trading fire over there. Uh, a Raven trading some fire with the Enforcer over here, but... But Black Once again, Thorn I'm seeing a lot of up. a lot of movement from Blackthorn, but the guys that were left behind and continued to trade just got punished for it. And this enforcer for Blackthorns is cored out at 61%. He's uh, taking a pretty big beating. Their Wolverine is uh, cored out as well. And it looks to me like the majority of the damage being dealt to uh, Isengrim's Wolverine is on uh, the left arm, the shield arm. Not a you know, their his right arm, which is the where most of his weapons are, are is in pretty good shape right now. Now, uh, Blackthorn's Arctic Cheetah is being, again, very aggressive. We're seeing some aggressive play by their lights. He is in good shape, but with small pulse lasers, he doesn't seem to be able to really close as much as he would like to be able to do. Although, here is uh, Independent for Isengrim, who's now out in the middle, and he is beat up. He has taken some fire now. Let's see whether uh, he's in a lot of trouble or not. And he is cored out. He's lost one of his torsos, and he is down. So, yeah. Blackthorn's has gotten a kill. Uh, they are very they spread out. They're just trying they're to take away every angle right now. Yeah. yeah, it looks like they're starting to move that into Mech the Dane and Terragato. So they did pull another one, but another Mech goes down for BTD. Things aren't looking too and, good. But yeah, their enforcers down below. They've got a Timberwolf and an enforcer now down below that are really beat up. That Timberwolf got stuck on the rocks and he is down. The enforcer got clear. I think he's trying to regroup, but that Timberwolf, when he was trying to escape, got stuck on the rocks. He backed mm -hmm. up in the wrong direction, and that cost him. And it is now 4-1 in favor of Isengrim. And now this Enforcer is going to peek here, and they, they uh, Isengrim's well aware of it. They see him. They are just punishing him for doing that. He's down to 44% here. Yep. So it, I guess they're just trying to figure out, okay, at this point, things are pretty out of reach. Can they core out the, the mechs that they've yeah. dealt they enough damage to? Is it possible to, to squeeze out a little bit more money out of this? Now, if I were Blackthorn, see, they, they've started to get the idea right here. They're using the canyons, but some of their maneuvers, they rather than go into the canyon, and Isengrim's not having any of it. They're just nope. pushing down this right This is going to look very bad. Now, Mech the Dane's taking a lot of additional fire from that yeah, aggressive peak, and he's actually yeah. fallen into the canyon. He's going to he go down here. here. Yeah. I would not I would be very surprised if he survives this. And now he is legged. But he is surviving it very well for falling in. 13%, 11% before going down. down. Yeah. That is interesting. Kill, three kills out of that. Three kills in the time it took for Mech Stormcrow to go down. That is insane. It, I mean, it was just... I would say, on BTD's part, just panic fire. They they were just yeah. aiming at anything they could. And uh, the last last mech, which is the Arctic Cheetah, which, as we know, are impossible to kill, goes down. And it goes 8-2 in favor of Isengrim on Candy Network. Now, I will say, uh, just as a correction, that was not Mech in the Stormcrow. Actually, it was an Ebon Jaguar, so a little bit more armor. Oh, Ebon J, uh, you know? All but right. you're right. He should have been, I mean, he fell right in the middle of those uh, remaining forces. He should have been down mm -hmm. uh, right away. When he fell, he was below 40% to begin with. He uh, That was an impressive job by him spreading the damage and really just a, uh, a poor job by Black of getting uh, getting the focused fire on the damage components on the remaining components that you need for the kill. Um, that was it's definitely an interesting. I mean, that was quite the transition from from Blackthorn's drop one to drop two. Where drop one they were really passive about it. I mean, they were aggressive in in drop two, but just uh, overall just not great movement. I think for them, mm -hmm. a lot of times where they should have gone low and instead they stayed high and took a lot more damage. Um, sometimes where they just got strung out, uh, people kind of pushing forward or, or falling behind because they're trading. And, and really, uh, some of the worst bit 
is is if you're gonna go if you're gonna stay high, everyone needs to stay high. If you're gonna go low, everyone needs to go low. But when mm-hmm. you have like half and half, I mean, for for a range build when they're trying to call a target to shoot, that just makes it that much easier because there's a lot less to choose from. And uh, let's let's go was... back to that initial fire starter. I mean, I don't I'm not sure what he wanted to do with that 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 didn't have much logic to it. Um, that just puts your team in such a terrible position to start starting uh, a light mech down right off the bat. And what I'm seeing here in the instant replay is when they made that charge across Theta, the, the Thunderbolt went first, took him so long to drop down into that ramp that he just got completely shredded during that transition, followed by the rest of his team ultimately dropping into the canyon, leaving a couple mechs up top like the Timberwolf to just take additional damage. Yeah, he was the only mech costly. really visible to Isengrim at that point, so of course they're going to shoot at him. And once they did get across, they didn't have 100% uh, jump jet mechs, so I'm pretty sure some of their team had to go all the way around to, to even get into the fight, or at least find a ramp. Mm-hmm. So that, that slowed them down, but uh, I mean, they did stay alive a lot longer than I thought they would have. Isengrim played smart. They continued to rotate away from the enemy. Yeah, they didn't play static. That was important. Almost, I mean, it, these are two range decks. These are two mid-range decks. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Isengrim did a good job keeping them at that optimal range. Not that that necessarily helps. Uh, you know, it's not a brawl deck you're against. But I think it just kept control because you are able to make the decision as to where you're yep. going. So you can choose the next hill that you want to turn and shoot from. Uh, and BTD was then just in almost like a chase sequence where they just continued to chase, and then once Isengrim moved up to Theta, it was just such a power position. They didn't need cover anymore. All they needed to do was get all of their weapons to bear at the same target and just continue pouring that fire anytime one of them peaked, just completely play whack-a-mole and take that away from them, and they did it very well. That's a good point. I feel like... From the very start, when uh, Eisengrim lined up in that uh, what was it Charlie Four Delta Four sort of that corner that everyone likes to hang out on on the map, mm-hmm. uh, you know, from the very start, I felt like Eisengrim dictated that game. Yeah, they were start constantly finish, in motion. They were in charge, mm-hmm. uh, and Blackthorns was reacting rather than acting for that entire game. They were they were saying, "Okay, this is where Eisengrim is. This is what we're doing next. This is what we're doing next." And Eisengrim, uh, you know, to their credit kept it that way. They didn't stay still and have Blackthorn say, okay, this is what Isengrim is doing, let's react to that and then now we have the upper hand. Instead, Isengrim kept rotating, kept keeping at their optimum range and moving their position to another, uh, you know, still a position where they would have a good engagement from their perspective, but continuing to force Blackthorns to react to whatever they were doing uh, rather than bring their own strategy into play, I think was the difference in that game. I mean, Mm-hmm. There was not a moment, I think, in that game where either of us uh, felt that Isengrim was not in complete control of that match. Absolutely. That was, I mean, so. it's it's so disheartening when you're trying to move up to gain gain an edge on your opponent, and you get there, and you look, and they're already at the next point, yep. shooting right back at you in a relative comfortable position. They have the option for cover, but they never really needed it. They never really needed to be yeah. in cover. They just needed to get all their guns to bear. They needed to have the firing lanes being able to shoot through long canyons when they dropped in. Take take those canyons away from them. You know, don't allow them to uh, yeah. to move up. That aggressive peak here from Dane trying to get a shot at that last one and then ultimately falling in the canyon. Um, I mean, that was that was a bit costly. I don't think that was necessary, but just the amount of time it took to kill that Evan Jaguar, which I kept calling a storm crow. Uh, you know, you know that was that was impressive. I mean, it, that's a combination of of mech spreading the damage, yeah. and uh, and BTD just not landing the shots where they needed to be. Yeah, and I think my maybe part of that is uh, Dane likes to be the hero, so he. I think if anyone's gonna fall into the canyon, it's got to be him. But you know that's why we love him. Yep. Um, but all in all, again, I think Isengrim. Uh, and, and really, they did that in the in the first match as well. Both of these matches so far, Isengrim has been aggressive, been quick with their movements, been um, committed to their movements. I mean, there's you don't see any sort of waffling. You know, oh, let's move here. Wait, never mind. Let's go back here. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they they get in been there very deliberate. and they've been very deliberate in what they do. And in both matches so far, they've dictated 
the flow of the game, what's happened. It's all happened on their terms. So I mean, Blackthorns the Groom's going to have to to look at this and say, okay, what can we do to change this up so that we can, you know, have a match on our terms? Maybe, and, and who knows, maybe that would be, uh, you know, switching from a range to a straight brawl. Clearly, right now, um, you know, it's kind of the whole whole round is going to Isengrim at this point. So something, you know, something has to change. And like I said, maybe that's, uh, you know, the entire concept. They've been going range, going range. Maybe now is the chance to go brawl. Yep. Uh, R2D2, I am sending you your message right now with your premium time code. So congratulations to you for uh, winning that one day premium time. Now, of course, I said now's the time to go brawl. Unfortunately, this is now HPG. It is a heavier drop. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe we'll see a brawl, but I doubt it. So I'll just stick my foot in my mouth. You but... know, the I think we're going it, to... It's hard to say because you can do multiple things here. But at the same time, this is the commander map. You have a Zeus. Yeah. You don't have the ability to dictate what the Zeus has in terms of like jump jets or, or like high mounts or anything. So you're kind of stuck with what you got. So I wouldn't be surprised to see a brawl here. So let's see what kind of mechs we're up against here. I'm seeing uh, Wolverine 6Ks, Evan Jaguar, Zeus... And Force 4R, Thunderbolt 5SS. What's the build on Skrull's 5SS? Let's take a look at that real quick. And I'm checking He's running out medium the, uh, pulse. Once again, Blackthorns is running kind of a mixed brawl, mix, uh, mix range deck. They've got a Nova with medium pulse lasers, um, a Sparky. That's an interesting mech to see in these sort of games, but a Sparky with uh, medium pulse lasers. And then they're running... Um, Wolverine 6K, so that's a ranged mech there. A Griffin 1E, e. that's interesting. Yeah. I have oh, that's the Sparky, right? Yeah, yeah I definitely got, haven't uh, seen that uh, very often. Ranged Timberwolf, they've got the medium laser Goss Hellbringer. So there again, this is sort of a a mix medium pulse and kind of medium clam mediums and Goss build, and then there's Zeus is a range build. That's three mm -hmm. large lasers and a Goss rifle on that. So uh, they're looking range here, and it looks like right now they're kind of uh, setting up in the corner and they're just challenging Eisen to start yeah, they're, doing whack-a-mole you know that might that might work for them you know they might have to force uh, uh, Isengrim into a brawl here uh, but if Isengrim plays very passively mm -hmm. BTD can get some of these shots in and we're seeing the first little lick of uh, large laser fire coming out from BTD so I, w I guess I wouldn't be surprised if they now know maybe these guys are sitting back and playing a range deck, so they're starting to think, how do we counter this? They have a couple Wolverine 6Ks themselves that they, they can put a little bit of damage downfield from range, but it's definitely yeah. not a majority of their mechs. And now BTD is in an int... I've, I've not seen this position before, to be honest. They're hanging out by, uh, really by the enemy gate and just kind of on that lower level that lowest part of HPG on the outer ring um, now they're, now they're starting to move and it looks like they're going underneath that's an interesting strategy with the fact that they're running and uh, it looks like uh, Isengrim has deck. seen this and they're trying to move up to, to maybe get some fire in but it's too late it, they didn't get yeah. a single shot in so they have moved underneath and uh, we'll see what happens here are they going to continue through this is where Seismic really wins out they do have a UAV up which goes down immediately but it looks, it like, looks like they are going right out the other coming, gate. He is coming out the gate. There's well, he's hesitating now. He must have been drawn he's, back. Yeah, must have been drawn back. They they all lined up on that uh, that gate there, and then then hesitated really, and it didn't pull out. Now they're kind of mm -hmm. spreading out a little bit. It looks like you know what I would be willing to bet that Eisengrim is running some seismics because they seem to absolutely. Be really I was just about to say. Uh, you would be absolutely Here foolish. They come out. They're coming out the corner, and they pop the UAV, which is just really just giving it away. I mean, uh, yeah. they know now. Here comes the fire. Isengrim is not moving fast enough to take advantage of this, though. They need to get yeah, up. Isengrim's got to get up on the corner. They're here. still they... kind of lollygagging. They have three guys on target, but that must have been a, a mixed call that I saw Max moving away from the fight, just missing beautiful opportunity to get shots down range. But BTD well, is moving time. away from the fight still, trying to yeah. keep it range, but. Isengrim now has that firing line up on HPG yeah. and is just putting the hurt down. 
I don't think BTD knows which target to shoot at first. It's all spread among every mech they see. They're flock shooting at this point, just trying to hit anything as they move somewhere. Yeah, Hellbringer is taking a pounding right now. He's back down to 72%. They've got their uh, Timberwolf is at 74. That's going to hurt. Let's take a look at the Hellbringer here. He has got a weak torso. Uh, he's already lost one medium laser. That's his laser shoulder that he's got down here. So that's going to that's really going to hurt here and and Eisengrim is just standing out in the open and and Blackthorn's really uh that push they had coming out the gate they again had a couple guys come out quicker than some of their teammates and and spread out a little bit and uh yeah I mean that whole that whole trip to the outside there. ring I mean so many of them are very damaged here and, and now they're trying to fight uphill. The only advantage yep. they might have there are just the uh, the hitboxes trying for Isengrim to kind of be on those edges. Sometimes you get some poor angles uh, yep. from the top down. But even so, I mean, they're... And it looks like Mech the Dane is going very aggressively on the left side, just taking <laughs> away their cover. Yeah, Mech the Dane He's about is, to get flanked by the Nova, the but the 5SS uh, is there to, to say, no, you're not getting my Jarl. <laughs> and Skuro so, at this point is, is literally just taking the And they're pushing hard. They're going to try and take advantage of these four Black positions. Is, is pushing up on them. Yeah, and, and Dane, uh, Dane took a lot of damage there for that move, and I don't think mm -hmm. he necessarily did what he wanted to. Nope. He's gotten some of Blackthorns back out in the open. That Wolverine 6K for Blackthorns is really beat up at this point. Um, but it... All in all, that's... Uh, and the first death of the, the game yeah, is on Isengrim. And now another they, one goes down for BTD, but... It's actually, yeah. the percentages are very in favor of Isengrim, but they can't get cocky here. They they need to keep their cord mechs in the back. Those aggressive movements are, you know, excessive damage. They need to be protecting those mechs, otherwise they will lose more than they need to here. This could have gone, you know, an 8-0 sweep if they kept playing it tight, but they have lost a mech, so another one goes down for BTD. Things are starting to swing heavily in favor of Isengrim. Yeah, uh, I think Isengrim's moving up at this point. They they looks like they're committing to, yep. to getting the four down, five down, and uh, the last and couple mechs are going down right here. For an answer here, he is again pushing right in there in a fifty four percent Evan Jaguar, but it's not going to matter at this point. They've got the advantage. They've got the win. Yep, and there it is, uh, eight one in favor of Isengrim. So what do you what did you see here? Like we we saw an interesting uh initial where they were they were in a power position they had very little cover which is not always a bad thing looking up to the center Isengrim played very passively just i'm assuming used up some of the clock talked about it you know how do we want to handle this what do we want to do and uh, they in the process of them talking about it BTD made the call to go underneath but it wasn't to to button up it wasn't to hold their ground or anything no. they continued on through and i i would say that you would have to be insane to come into hpg manifold and not bring at least one seismic you would be yeah. you would be completely insane not to have at least one uh with that said i'm not sure why eisengrim didn't have all eight of their mechs immediately shredding oh, yeah. btd as they came out that other side um, that that could have been a missed call. Maybe the, somebody did have seismic, but called the wrong coordinates. Maybe people didn't listen to the call. But three mechs were making those shots, mm -hmm. but it was not everybody. Yeah, and and the other thing, the other side to that is, uh, BTD made that push, and they had a couple guys really full speed come out there and and swing wide, uh, like they were engaging. And the rest of them were, were not full speed ahead. They were actually backing up, trying to shoot as they were backing up. But that slows them down. And it really mm -hmm. strung them out and gave Isengrim time to recover from the fact that, yeah, they only had three guys up on that firing line to begin with. But with just how long it took and how strung out BTE got to get out of that position, I think kind of coughed up the advantage that Isengrim gave them. Uh, we're watching it now on the Twitch, and, and there they are popping... Uh, or they've they've just gone underneath that that uh, set the Sparky came out and came back in, um, so Isengrim you know lined up in that corner where the Sparky came out and really didn't react uh, to the movement. If 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 BTD was um, a little more grouped together, a little more uh, kind of all in one group and all shooting at the same time when they moved out, they might have might have been able to swing the the damage a little bit more in their favor. Um, 
Because, yeah, they, they were, unfortunately, they just took so much fire coming out here. We're watching it now mm-hmm. on the Twitch replay, and, and this is what happened. Yeah, they've got the main body for BTD is backing up and trying to shoot up from the inside of the ramp. And they've got a couple guys that just must have gone full speed ahead. I mean, the Hellbringer and uh, looks like the 6K. and I guarantee you that the, this battle would have been over at least a minute sooner had Eisengrim been right up on that edge yeah. firing down at him. So that gave BTD a little bit of an opportunity. But even with three mechs firing down at him, it was just fair game. And if they were focusing properly and not really spreading all that damage out, you know, they that's a huge blow and that was probably on that initial hellbringer that came out just got completely shredded by by those yeah, initial shots so that's pretty uh that's pretty rough that's very rough and then the yeah. continued movement along the the gully there along the right side but not all as a group people still up people still down just like we saw on canyon network uh isengrim just basically shooting at whatever's available it is a lot of damage spread but when you're not taking return fire who cares you know you're mm-hmm. you're using up your heat and they're not really going aggressive on you so every bit of damage you do means something and yep. and it it definitely meant something there just that how low all of those percentages were uh, they were able to just continue just slowly wearing them down once they did get the position that I wouldn't even necessarily call that the position they wanted but when they got into a favorable position for their deck they were already so low that they were they were peaking very gingerly it was whack-a-mole for them they could no longer hold the power position like they had at the beginning of the game and when you get into that position where not only are you down in in health but you're also having to whack-a-mole and the other team is in the power position where they don't even have to move they just have to aim and shoot that's not a good position to be in i mean it's it's a hard place to be in and even when you once you get to that place what do you do what what can you do the only thing I could think of is to try and maybe make it out one of the gates and draw it to a, not necessarily a stalemate, but try, try and draw Isengrim, who have been historically aggressive in this in this match so far, draw them to you and maybe try and get that power position back and and take those uh, take away the comfort that Isengrim was in by making yeah. them rush in through the gate after you, but. It, it's when you're looking up and you're seeing 50 percent across the board it's it, you start to feel a little bit hopeless and it's it's very difficult to turn that around and uh it, things just slowly got worse for them uh they did score a kill uh they did not get completely 8 would so uh i think that uh, wolverine could have done a better job staying out of the fight uh he may have thought that hey we're beating the crap out of him i want to get my shots in and uh it cost him his mech so yeah in the grand scheme of things, it probably doesn't mean that much. But when you're when the league scoring is based on how many mechs are destroyed, you shouldn't be careless and shouldn't be giving those kills to the other team because uh, that'll translate into how that team does in the rest of the ladder. You know, and who knows? Something might happen. Some screenshots might not get uploaded. Somebody might not have a match count, and the, that extra little bit of C bills that you earned uh, by duking it out could go in your favor to move you up a slot yeah and it's and at the end of the day i mean if you're beat up and you know your team's in that power position and they're really taking it to them Mm -hmm. you don't have to be a hero i think maybe uh who knows maybe dane rubs off on his on his fellow fellow team members he certainly loves the uh the hero role Mm -hmm. seeing some comments about that in chat as well um, but uh, you're right. I mean, that, that Wolverine went down, and I think both of us were surprised yeah. to see that go down. Especially go down before any of the other mechs. Yeah. That's yeah, at that point, not uh, characteristic. Should probably have been taking it a little easier, but we're in the next match. Let's see uh, see what they're going about here. But, I mean, we're being hard on them and stuff, but ultimately it's an 8-1 victory for Isengrim, so that's really what matters. So we are in the uh, Frozen City night. Uh, we are rolling the 2-2-2-2 deck. No duplicates here, so let's see if anybody broke the rules. Because we had some controversy last time. Doesn't look to me like we have any duplicate chassis whatsoever. Uh, I've got three clan mechs on BTD. And and... now this ought to be pretty interesting because it looks like uh, BTD for the first time tonight has gone with a full range build. Except for their one Arctic Cheetah. Uh, And that's funny, on on a characteristically brawly map too and now and take a look at this they are going with the far ranged 
Absolutely, yeah, I mean, that's pretty sneaky here. Yeah. Now it, yeah. it all it all comes down to how fast does Star Wolf in his Firestarter take a look down General Alley here? Does he make that that connection? And he's about to right here. They are now made. They get some early shots on that Firestarter, but now Isengrim knows where this team is going. They know that they're in a range deck. They know that they are now taking positions in the far range. And Isengrim is going to have to make a decision here. How are we going to capitalize on this in our uh, predominantly brawler deck? I, I wouldn't say they're 100% brawler. But they but... are definitely less range than uh, than BTD. And mm -hmm. you know what? Uh, if I was Star Wolf, I would be happy with that result. He got them fairly early information, mm -hmm. only took 4% damage from this, and now he's kind of snuck around to the corner. And, uh, looks oh, like this Warhawk is going to take quite a few hits here. That was a very aggressive yeah, push did. just to get one shot in. Now, it looks like they're all trying to armor share and, and maybe, you know, get away from the whack-a-mole, but they are taking massive amounts and of damage when they're trying to get in here. Right now. Uh, yeah, Terragato, Terragato took quite a bit of hits. So this, this is a very dangerous place to be peeking. Uh, yep. The 4N is trying to use those very high laser mounts just to put anything on anybody, and they are getting successful hits on the Raven. But so far, uh, two mechs only for Isengrim took massive hits, but the, once again, the percentages for BTD is starting to drop. This Raven has nowhere to go. Nowhere to go. He's He went left, he got punished. He went high up in the back, he got punished. The Stalker is landing his shots. They're, they're trying to take him down. He's down to 47% right now. That is that is pretty now, rough Isengrim for that Raven. Is, Isengrim is pushing on the... Uh, pushing on on BTD's left, and they aren't looking that way right now. They're engaged with that stalker up on the hill. Isengrim's spread out. They've got some firing lines here. It looks to me That's like some of them are down. figuring it out, but and there's yeah, a good strike. This is going to be a good hit on the stalker. That Massive stalker arty strike in the backfield, down to 46%. The direwolf taking a lot of shots from that left side, and they're just in in a mostly, you know, brawly deck, but they are pretty mid-ranged, and they're taking advantage of that, just drilling it into him yeah. from the side. That stalker up above now is really just killing them. Let's see. Uh, and it's crazy. Got I mean, they and Arctic Cheetah just moved up on him. They are in a power position, and they shouldn't be using cover. But here they are behind the boat yep. once again, now dropping into that whack-a-mole uh, because they they yeah. lost the initiative. They could no longer keep up that sustained fire on Isengrim, and they are being punished for it. So every time somebody ducks behind the boat, somebody else starts getting shredded. Two down for BTD. This is such a bad place to be in. Uh, I mean, this strat can work, but honestly, I would I would give all props to that scout for going right to that generali and just yep. completely um, taking that initial movement away from them. This might and not even be where they want to be. And they're uh, they've got them all turned around here. This is this is going to get ugly here. It looks second. to me like uh, Super Atomic might go down here. He is getting yeah, pretty beat up, but he's in an Arctic yeah. Cheetah, and it takes so much to kill him. He is running for it, trying to preserve that mech, which is very smart move on his part. And he does get into the backfield, and does not give that to him. So that's very good good play by Super Atomic in the Arctic now, Cheetah. There is going after Terragato in the six K. He is really beat up Terragato, but he's I don't spreading know he's so well. Him. Look at that spread. He's just not giving them a clean shot on his crit components. And if they take down that 5SS, a perfect 8-0 victory. That was impressive. Look at how low Dane, Dane's group is with the Isengrim here. And they have such low percentages, but their guys played so well. When they realized that they were a focused target, they got the hell out of there. And and that was just solid gameplay all around by Isengrim. Uh, the, from the initial scouting... Uh, the initial peaking was a little rough, where they were opting to peak their yep. big boys up over the top, like the Warhawk. That was pretty rough, took a lot of early damage there. But then identifying that, hey, we can't do this anymore, let's let the Stalker do it, because he's capable of it with the high mounts. The rest of us, let's swing around our right flank and start putting shots on him. And actually forcing a team that is in a power position, forcing them... To, to play whack-a-mole out in the open because they're all hiding behind a little tiny boat. That was that was yep. a very good play by Isengrim. I don't know what Blackthorns could have done any differently uh, to, to try and pull that out besides maintain the power position and just hit all of the targets yeah. that you aim at. I mean, it's it's so rough, but when, when Isengrim came around that right side... Uh, BTD needed BTD to be didn't make those shots. They only yeah. had maybe two or three mechs looking in that direction. Yeah. And uh, and so they weren't able to continue putting eight mechs worth of fire on target 
and and that's really what cost him. Smart move by Eisengrim coming around that that lower side, uh, and not only that, but peaking the high ground like that, you're silhouetted. It's such a hard target yeah. to not hit. But then when you bring it down low and you start peeking around that right side, uh, it's it puts you at their level, and you just start playing some raw face-to-face action. You really don't have a lot of cover to peek out of, but they brought multiple mechs, and they took the power position on that right side. And I know I keep saying that word. That's my term for it, where you can sit five mechs shoulder-to-shoulder. They don't give a shit about taking cover. Maybe if they take massive hits from somebody, they can spread it and back up a few steps. But they don't need cover because they're armor-sharing, Somebody looks at them and says, holy shit, there's five mechs right there. You maybe take a shot, you flock shoot a little bit, you don't know who you're focusing, and then you take five mechs worth of fire right into your face, and it completely shreds you down. That's uh, that's the power position, and that's just uh, that's some quality gameplay there by, by Isengrim. Yeah, and that, you're right. That was really, I mean, the beginning of that match, BTD was in the power position, and Isengrim really with that ill-advised poke on that hill i mean they damaged perspective even after that poke eisengrim was losing that match um and they did a great job like you said of you know leaving the stalker up there the one mech they had that was capable of poking that hill uh in a good situation they left him up there and they moved they changed uh they went from essentially being down in the match down at least by damage to kind of changing their position and then going up on damage and i think what cost BTD that match is that when Isengrim started moving down, they needed to have the awareness, hey, they're coming down to our level. And honestly, I think they should have swung out wide behind the boat and reestablished their power position for that level. Yes, the Stalker was up there and was getting free shots at them. I think at that point you tell your Cheetah, um, you know, hey, get up. we need you to get up there and, and at least get that Stalker distracted while we engage these guys. But the fact that Isengrim adjusted their position uh, certainly merited I think a counter adjustment by BTD but we just never got that they they held that position and ultimately that enabled Isengrim to take what was really a bad location uh, at the top of that ridge into a good location without worrying about the reaction from BTD Yep, and uh, to everybody in the stream who won't hear this for another five minutes, I did open up a new raffle for another premium time code. We'll be closing that shortly. Uh, type exclamation point raffle to enter. Uh, after this, I would say after the last drop here on Mining Collective, I will do the right away, right when we're finished, I will run the raffle for the Mech Bay code. So uh, stick around after the match is done, and uh, hopefully we can... Uh, get a winner for that and i do i do want to give a special shout out there to star wolf and that fire starter that was excellent light piloting uh, at the beginning mm-hmm. to to essentially you know have the role of finding the enemy team peaking a power position where you didn't know they were there at first uh you know exposing yourself to an entire firing line where you're the only target there mm-hmm. and only taking four percent damage being able to spread that damage to get out of there and also get your team that information i think any drop commander um would take that deal any day a four percent damage in order to know where all eight of the enemy mechs are uh, absolutely yep and uh you know not every light pilot would check that i you know, some of them are are finding it important to check. You know what's coming into Lower City and things like that. And ultimately, he might have gone that direction, mm-hmm. but they did have more than one um, light pilot, so they could have divvied up the roles appropriately between the two of them to make sure that somebody checked every angle that they needed. So that's uh, that was very good, uh, and how quickly he was able to get that information. And Eisengrim had that opportunity to to keep them from getting comfortable you know they got to that position they saw the fire starter they know we're made they couldn't you know say continue any further down the line so they opted to stay there which i didn't i don't see people operating there very often in a range deck as much as further down the line so there's a possibility that that light identifying them there uh could have uh caused that to happen yeah yeah, and, and the other side of that was that BTD kept their lights with them, which 
I'm not saying is the wrong move because it gives you that extra bit of firepower. They had uh, ranged lights. They did have a cheetah, though, and I almost would have uh, liked to have seen that cheetah not stay with the main body because in that position, I mean, a small pulse laser cheetah is just another, I guess, another target to shoot at, spread a little bit of damage, but it would have been, I think, helpful for BTD to have that cheetah out and about wandering around kind of the the other side of the map yeah maybe up uh, into lower city and, just if yeah. anything trying to harass the other light trying maps. to ha- harass or even just at the beginning say okay guys you know give them the information about what Eisengrim is running what they're doing uh, would it have changed their strategy I, I don't know but it would have at least given them that extra bit of information i think uh at this point the difference in that match you could point it down to and you know, we'll give uh, Russ something to cheer about, right? Was, mm-hmm. That was that was some information warfare right there. That was Eisengrim's lights doing their job, their role as, as gathering information as scouts. And BTD not having that information, whether that would have changed the outcome or not, I'm not sure. But I think you can certainly say for Eisengrim um, that if they hadn't had that scouting information, that game might have been different. So, yeah, I mean... There you go, information warfare, and even in the competitive... Uh, Who would have thunk it, right? But, but you know yeah, what? I am, I've i always been huge uh, in my matches at stressing how important that information is. Uh, knowing what deck they're in, knowing where main body is, and things like that. And and absolutely, I mean, I don't know if this is the same information warfare that Paul is talking about, where I think he wants you to you know hold, hold locks and stuff to try and... Uh, get deal max damage and changing sensor ranges and stuff, but you didn't even need sensors to know what was going on here, and that yeah. that call was so important. And I'm just seeing in the replay, like just awesome, awesome artillery strikes on that stalker there. Um, you know, even the hits on that initial warhawk peak weren't that substantial because uh, even though BTD was in that power position, they did not punish him as much as they probably should have. I only saw maybe about four or five mechs getting their shots on, and by the time some of those last few mechs got their shots in, the Warhawk had already turned his torso and used his arm as a shield and back, backed into safety. So it was it was glancing blows. They did hit him for, you know, 19%, which is you never want that in a single peak, mm-hmm. but it could have been way worse. Uh, yeah. Against a higher... higher uh, uh, you know, a more seasoned, higher division team, uh, like say, like an SJR or something. If they were in that position, in that uh, BTD was, I would see that Warhawk probably be killed in in one volley uh, through focus fire. So that that's really what kind of sets teams apart: is can they can they land those shots? Can it be on the component that they needed to be, and uh, and can they seal the deal? So. Um, we're just uh, watching the end of the replay here, and once again, mad props to those mechs uh, on Isengrim that were able to keep mm-hmm. their their mechs alive. The unkillable Arctic Cheetahs, um, you know, the Wolverine, just massive spreads here. Yeah, just that's incredible. Beautiful spread Wolverine. damage from yeah. the Wolverine. And returning fire. You know, he was able to return fire during that entire ordeal, and... Uh, just kept spreading, kept his torso moving, and were able to uh, pull out the win and keep everyone alive. Yeah, that uh, that was some very nice individual gameplay, I think, from Eisengrim between Firestarter at the beginning, Wolverine at the end. Uh, you know, some nice gameplay in the middle, and and again, uh, I think that was the first time we've seen BTD dictate a game uh, in terms of the initial movement. I don't think Eisengrim was expecting that. They got the scouting, luckily, but I don't think they were expecting that move. But then BTD kind of stagnated with their position. They stayed there. Eisengrim took back the advantage, and eventually that got them the match. So, um, you know, we'll see on this this last match whether we can whether uh, BTD can flip the script here. But right now, Eisengrim has definitely been the uh, more proactive, the more aggressive of the two teams, and it's paying off for them. And congratulations to Braveheart95 winning the last premium time code. Our next raffle will be immediately following drop 5, and uh, it will be for a mech bay. So that'll be that'll be the money right there. That's the good stuff. Oh, yeah. Everybody likes mech bays. So going into uh, Mining Collective with a 4-0 lead, a very substantial 4-0 lead uh, for Isengram, what do you think we're going to see here? You know, I think 
Uh, both teams have shown that they're committed so far to the range build. I think Mining Collective is another map where you, you certainly can run the range decks. Um, I would expect both teams to be in range. Again, I'm going to push for Brawl. I like Brawls. That's me. Um, so if you're watching this and I spectate another match of yours, maybe anyone in chat, throw in a Brawl deck for me. It'll make me feel better. But uh, it, I think we're going to see ranged again from both teams. Brain, ranged again, huh? Uh, that's my bet. That's, I mean, that's a solid bet from what we've been seeing. Uh, I, Mining Collective absolutely can run ranged. Uh, I've, I've seen multiple teams prove that. Um, so, but the, you know, it's, it could, it could devolve into uh, a brawl. Uh, there are avenues for mechs to move up and, and get into that, but I guess we'll have to see what happens here. I think uh, higher, higher teams typically run range for this, although, you know, who knows. Uh, it might all be just mid-range poke, just try to wear down the other team. But uh, we might see an aggressive brawl rush. And if you, what I would like to see, or what would be really cool, is a straight up hundred percent across the board, both both teams just straight up get right into a brawl. Yeah, that would be really a really fun way to end the stream. Yeah, just an all-out massive brawl. But you know, the thing about a brawl like that, when you're trying to preserve mechs, it is very difficult to lock down the kills and not lose something in the process so i think that with this rule set trying to keep the other team down um, pushes you to range it pushes you to range because you can wear down mechs without losing them you can opt to have a, a hurt mech step back and stay out of the fight or at least protect himself a little bit better and you can get these 8-0 decisions it's much harder to get an 8-0 decision in a brawl versus brawl uh, it yeah. can happen. It absolutely can happen. But that's typically because either somebody made a really bad call, or one team was just playing significantly worse and just aiming worse, not focusing yeah. properly, things like that. Um, but a, a lot of strategies go out the window when it ends up brawl versus brawl. Yeah. Now I'm going to use that to segue into some of the things talking about the chat. Uh, some comments about how maybe some of the rules either encourage or don't encourage the the camping. Uh, some comments that the having the kills be so important helps, uh, you know, helps remove some of that camping attitude. Mm -hmm. But you're right. The other side of that is having the kills be important encourages the range back. So maybe making kills important encourages you not to camp the whole game, but having kills be important encourages you to play a little uh, to at least finish the game. Yeah. Nobody likes a watching more, uh, a zero zero decision. Exactly. Nobody likes it. So, all right, well, we are in the match, Mining Collective. Uh, this is drop five, so there's four assaults on this. We're not going to be seeing any very fast movement here. Two heavies and then the two lights for, for scouting. Uh, I'm seeing on uh, on Isengrim's side, two stock of Ren's most likely running the six large laser builds. A Banshee 3E, most likely with the do, um, Tri AC5, two large pulse laser perhaps, or maybe two large lasers. Uh, a summoner for their for uh, their heavy, a warhawk for their assault. So going yeah. going a little bit lower tonnage on their assaults there. A little bit there. quicker, maybe. A little bit quicker, perhaps. Yeah. Now, um, that's interesting because uh, BTD is also running a summoner. So we're gonna see summoner. Maybe we'll see summoner versus summoner uh, yep. in this match. And it seems to me like both teams are currently NASCARing. This looks like this is. The C or B line, and Isengrim is moving up the E and D line right now. So they're kind of kind of cross paths here. The Arctic Cheetah just kind of looking in that direction, just seeing if he can see anything over there. But I don't think they've seen each other yet. Uh, yeah, what is, what do we got over here? What is this? This is uh, a Firestarter S Trader Cat way across the other side of the map. Which I mean, that could work for him to get that information from that yeah. angle if they come rolling that way he might have seen isengrim and they may know where they are now and can start planning and i don't know if isengrim knows and we have some initial fire yeah, here so they know where each other are there they there's no oh the stalker is running into a wall isengrim could take advantage of that but uh no, just he got away with he it, got away yeah. with it yeah that could have been that could have been very bad but they just skirted past and uh, and managed to to squeeze it out without taking too much. And the oh, fire and starter the runs fire into, the into the wall. Oh, <laughs> oh no, he's warping. In... Oh, oh man. dear, that that hurts. That, that hurts. 
10%. I mean, it was most likely spread, but that's all unnecessary damage right there. And uh, BTD continues through the, the tunnel into uh, Isengrim's spawn area. Now they've got some engagement. BTD again with two mechs kind of out in advance. The Summoner uh, is leading the way. And then the Arctic Cheetah uh, and that Summoner didn't take really any damage, but uh, he took some fire in that direction, kind of drew the attention of Isengrim uh, over that way. And it looks like Isengrim is again setting up uh, in a power position. They don't seem to want to really keep NASCAR. They almost want to, uh, might be considering turning and facing at this point. But they do not have all of their mechs aiming in the same direction right now. So they, if they want to use this as their power position, and now they're starting to all move in the same direction, they might be heading up to Theta to try and take advantage of that. Yeah, Some of them may be the caught in the cross here. The Summoner has now got the... Uh got the vision on them didn't get a shot across yeah he drilled it into the mountainside btd at this point uh will most likely be aware that they are going into theta and that might change their strategy it looked like btd was trying to get around behind isengrim uh on their edge and and now they've got to now they've got to engage and here's center. star wolf yeah. over here on the left side again uh watching to see if they come down eline he's gonna have very good vision He's ready to just kind of watch and, and give that information to his team. Uh, looks like uh, an Arctic Cheetah has seen him, and they're going to try and run him down, but he's going to be gone by the time they get there. But more information coming in from the scouts on Isengrim. Mm -hmm. Quality gameplay right there. And again, the summoner is really, he's hes way in front of his team. The, the lights are with him, but uh, you know they kind of got a different role in here than the summoner, and he just took a lot of fire to get up there. Yep. Now, uh, I'm not... It, it, the, the, the thing that's kind of working against Isengrim here, uh, they aren't necessarily in a power position. They're very very spread, but they're not all able to hit the same targets at the same time. Yeah. They don't even have all of their guns to bear at this point. But the thing that's working for them is BTD hasn't reached their destination yet, and, and they're not punishing Isengrim as they're no. in that kind of slappy, sloppy, staggered position. So they're they're moving they across now and starting to take right a lot of hits. Across, yeah. But and not returning a lot of fire either. They are they are in a poor position as they're moving across here, and that yep. that hurts. But really, they the thing that BTD does have going for them is they're all together, and when they do move around, they're going to be able to see one mech at a time because Isengrim is not in a power position. They're they're very staggered. They can punish that Timberwolf. Yeah, that they can punish that Summer Wolf, Wolf there. Summoner. Uh, but if they keep going through, they're going to eventually just take shots from every single member of Isengrim. Um, and they need to get a rhythm going here. They need to try and find a position that works for them. And if they just keep fighting these onesie twosie fights, they've shown even all the way back to River City that that hasn't been working for them. Yeah, and now they're moving along. They took a lot of damage there. Another artillery strike hit them as they're moving along. I mean, they've got a big group here uh, that's moving together, but they're not... They're just not putting the return fire out. I mean, mm -hmm. they're taking damage and, and basically not able to shoot back or, or uh, you know, just not at the right angle. I mean, now they're on the low ground. You know, that Stalker can engage, but their Dire Wolf is stuck because he's got low weapon mounts and things, and he's he's. We've got a Stalker down. duel here between Winston and uh, whoever that other one over there, Super Atomic. Uh, Winston's not blinking. Every time Super Atomic peaks, uh, he gets shots in, but he started moving and got moving, stuck got on the stuck. wall and extra yep. damage taken. Unnecessary damage. So going Once back again. to going back to Canyon Network, where we were talking about, you know, Isengrim kept moving, kept moving, and and it, we never thought that it wasn't in in their control. In this instance, BTD's moving, but they're not taking control. It's mostly just running around the outskirts of the map and taking shots. Yeah. Now, some some of uh, Isengrim's mechs have taken quite a bit of damage here. The, mech the Dane, once again, is is the most damaged mech on Isengrim. <laughs> is anybody uh, really surprised? <laughs> not surprised there. Now, now uh, BTD is moving their lights oh up on top. Oh, dear. To... Oh, that Arctic Cheetah peeking up the yeah, left yeah, side, running is. straight backwards away from a Timberwolf, getting a goss straight to the, straight to the eyeballs. Uh, this is starting to fall apart really quick for BTD, even though they have dealt quite a bit of damage to Isengrim. Not well, enough, comparatively. And there moment. goes the there fire goes starter on the, the left side. Starters. Stalker just went down, and now they're just coming around the corner one at a time. This is just asking. And Isengrim them. is just starting to surround them and just yeah. drill them in from yeah, every angle possible. Just, uh, and their, their Banshee is still in the back. Their Summoner now, he's he's in the corner. They are really spread out and, and just 
basically one-on-one -on -one engagements at this point, except for the fact that uh, Eisengrim has a lot more mechs to shoot him with. Yep, and a bad shutdown from the Banshee will probably seal his fate, and uh, the other BTD mechs dueling it out in the uh, D line there. Uh, this one's definitely going to go in favor of uh, Isengrim. Uh, Isengrim did lose the Warhawk. Mech the Dane doing a very good job keeping himself alive, playing the backfield now, realizing that anything that hits him is going to kill him, but he's he's yep. preserving his mech. I, I will laugh if that Archita finds him and, and hunts him down with 62% health left, but it that looks Archita's like he's committed to try and taking down the, the Stalker 4N. He's doing that's work on him. He's yeah. doing work on him, but uh, he's being run down now by the Firestarter, and it, that's going to take care of him. And there it is. That is the end of Another the match. Eight Another 8-1. Uh, ultimately, uh, the match going 5-0 in favor of Isengrim. Uh, BTD just didn't seem to have it uh, have it together. In they didn't focus fire properly. They didn't. Their movement was it was interesting. It was staggered. It wasn't it wasn't deliberate. Um, y you know they they weren't moving as a group proper. I mean, moving together is one thing, but having people high and low. You know, if you're moving together, you're either sharing the shots or you're not taking any shots at all. Yeah. And when we're seeing constant fire coming in from Isengrim. Uh, just beating the crap out of them, and and they're all moving together. It's like this should not yeah. be happening. You know, they should either be returning fire, or or not moving at all. I mean, it's it's hard to say because every map's different, but really it comes down to reacting to what the other team is doing. And Isengrim, all they had to do is sit in the center and pivot and just continue. Like I'm not sure where BTD was actually headed. Yeah. Where where were they going? Were they were they trying to find a position that worked? Because that position was never going to come. Isengrim yeah. never had to move. They just could sit there, ultimately surrounding him for the finish. But they never had to feel. They never felt like they had to, a reason to move. Yep. You know. So I don't know how BT, BT, BTD could have better covered that. But um, you know, things things moved downhill very quick. And the most concerning thing for me uh, was seeing all that movement, seeing BTD taking all that damage as they were moving, and really not giving any of it back. I mean, you just mm -hmm. saw mechs marching along to whatever destination they had in mind, you know, getting shot, and you know, very little return fire on BTD. I mean, it's one thing to to not give Isengrim a, a reason to move because of where BTD is lining up because they're still trying to look for the right place. But man, you got to get some return fire in there and and really um, you know, at least make them a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, you know, they did manage to get the the one mech down. Uh, mech the Dane was pretty beat up. But uh, all in all, that that seemed more like a move uh, again this this sense of uh, reacting by BTD with Isengrim you know, again felt the whole match in charge and I think that's kind of the theme of the night here was that Isengrim seemed to be in control of almost every single match they were involved and in. even maybe when they didn't start off in control they certainly gained control uh, in just about every match tonight and that I think reflects in the in the end result of you know a 5-0 decision for, for Isengrim and I mm -hmm. think that comes down to uh, you know the that feel you know the fact that Isengrim was in control BTD was reacting all night um, so it, it definitely uh, definitely cost him. So my wife is spoiling the game. She says I have to stop streaming because now we're losing because of it. Uh, ten, ten. Well, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna spoil it if anybody's watching that wants to watch it themselves. So. Spoiler alert: Denver <laughs> is winning. So, uh, for all, you, all you Green Bay fans, you'll just have to commiserate with Bandit after uh, after the game. I'm drinking right now. I do have the raffle open for the Mech Bay, so type exclamation point raffle. Uh, I'm going to leave this one open for a little bit here and uh, allow enough people to join. But, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm just, my wife says, I'm destroying the Packers. I hope you're happy. Great. Thanks. Thanks, honey. Very happy. Thanks, yeah. honey. It's all my fault. Because <laughs> I haven't missed a game this season so far. So, That's but tough. yeah, um, Isengrim has to feel very good about their uh, their 
uh, performance tonight. Uh, you know, there were some things that they can clean up, but for the most part, that was a pretty substantial victory. Uh, yeah. I think they should be extremely proud of how they did. Uh, BTD, uh, you know, back to the drawing board. Whoa. I think BTD needs BTD. to start. Oh, man. <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I just caught that. <laughs> wow. Uh, whoa. Okay. Okay. BTD needs to... Uh, you know, I hope they can use some of our footage here uh, to to go back and look at how how the their enemy was moving, how they were moving, what we saw, yeah. some of the things we had to say. Hopefully, that some of that uh, is valuable to them because I think that it will be more valuable to them than say to Isaac Grimm in this instance. Um, so I I really hope that they use this opportunity to to take this resource and and just try to better themselves because. I like seeing teams uh, grow, and I like seeing them become better, and, uh, you know, I want to see teams move up, and I think that they have the potential to do that. They shouldn't be disheartened by this. I mean, it hurts, but um, yeah. they were the underdogs coming into this uh, because they, you know, they didn't win their division last season against Eisengrim, mm -hmm. so uh, it was a... Uh, you know they they have a little bit of growing to do yet, and and it really comes down to can they get the practices in? Can they rehearse? Can they scrimmage? You know, try and try and figure out what what's working, what's not working, and, and things like that. And yeah. uh, and on the drop commander side, we saw some where we were wondering there was some non calls. Uh, there's some interesting calls. Uh, hopefully they can go back and look at this and and maybe. Uh, change that for the better. Um, so cool. Uh, once again, thanks to everybody for watching. Uh, you guys have been fantastic viewers. A uh, little bit lighter tonight. I'm going to blame that on the Packer game. <laughs> but uh, you know, once again, give us uh, give us you know feedback. You know, how can we improve? I, obviously, I can't make matches any closer. Unfortunately, I can wish for that, but uh, you know I, I will try to pick good good matches uh, and and try and uh, find ones that will be interesting. Yeah. So give, that... me, give us a give us a brawl next week if you're in MRBC. Let's see some brawls, guys. Yeah. Just get get that involved. <laughs> well, I mean, we know why, and it's because yeah, the rule set. It's, it's true. The scoring it's and, true, and stuff but, like that. You know, do it for MD. Keep that in mind. I'm going to do the last chance for the raffle. And I'll be closing it, and we'll see who gets the mech bay here. All right, cross your fingers, everybody. Yeah, I think uh, at the end of the day, hopefully BTD goes back. They look at these matches, and um, I think what would really a good starting point would just be to, to say, look, you know, sometimes... Um, you know, we need to make a call uh, as a strategy and and go with it and commit. And if it, if it's good, it works. If it's bad, it doesn't. Um, but you know, maybe that that'll help. I think some of what cost them these matches that I almost seemed almost uh, a little bit of timidness, too much passive uh, play, and too much reacting. I mean, sometimes you just gotta grab the bull by the horns, right? Charge in there and say, this is this is how we're gonna play this, and the other team's gonna have to deal with it. Um, so I, hopefully they'll be able to go back, like you said, look at the footage, kind of say, okay, you know, compare it to a team like Isengrim, really two teams coming from the same place. Uh, Isengrim obviously has done very well. I think they, they certainly were impressive tonight uh, and how much they've grown. And I hope BTD looks at that and says, hey, these guys, uh, you know, we're coming from the same place. We're, you know, headed in the same direction. Mm -hmm. It's certainly possible. You know, there's no reason why Isengrim can do this and Black Orange Dragoons can't. You know, so yeah. I hope they look at it. Yeah, it's tough. No one likes getting shut out. No one enjoys, you know, losing like that. But I hope they look at that and say, you know, you know what? These guys are just like us, and if they can get there, we can too. Let's go back and look at it and figure out what we need to do differently, uh, and and you know, make the changes and then. Hopefully they'll also be able to, to improve to that level. I mean, from a, a shout casting perspective, and I, I think from a viewer perspective, you know, five zero decisions are only fun for the teams that win. Mm -hmm. Everyone else, whether you're a viewer, shout caster, or on the unfortunately the, the other side of that, 
it's, it's not fun. I mean, yeah. no one no one wants to see that. We want to see good, close games. And frankly, even as uh, a, a participant in tournaments, you know, if we have a you know a game that's that's real close, it's it's a lot of fun. I mean, even you'd like to win five zero, but you're you know you got a, a a real close game, you enjoy it as well. So mm-hmm. I, I really do hope that Blackthorn Dragoons doesn't doesn't get too down on themselves after this and and kind of takes just take a step back maybe look at it you know a day later when you kind of cooled off and and say okay what do we need to do to do the same you know to 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 get to that same level to make that same improvement that you know a team that was very much like them uh did Mm mm-hmm Yep, so uh, I think that's going to uh, end our shoutcast today. Uh, Once again, thanks to everybody for watching. Uh, I'll try and do at least once a week. I have a lot of fun doing these. And uh, once again, thank you, MD, for coming by. And I thought you did a fantastic job as my co-caster. And uh, we didn't have nearly as many glitches this week as last week, so that makes me pretty happy. I will be putting up the video on demands for anybody who missed the match. I'll be putting them up on Reddit, and, and it'll be on YouTube ultimately. And uh, once again, follow MRBC League on Twitch so you guys can uh, get notified when uh, other matches occur because I am not the only streamer on this channel. Uh, we have a, a couple guys that are really putting a lot of effort in. So, uh, And then the last little bit of note is there's 48 hours remaining on the Hairbrain Schemes Kickstarter for Battletech. So if you haven't heard of it yet or if you uh, have and, and are considering upping your... Uh, your pledge uh i would say go do that we got two days left and we want to push for the pvp uh bit of it so we're very close uh head over to the harebrain schemes kickstarter and uh get your money in there and we can enjoy a very nice uh battle tech top down turn-based game together so all right well i'll see you guys later see you guys hey i'm mitch i'm mike and I'm Jordan, being held captive in this television until the end of the Kickstarter campaign. We are in the final 48 hours of our Kickstarter campaign, and if you haven't heard about our Battletech game, stay tuned and learn what it's all about. Hi, Kickstarter! I'm proud to announce that Harebrain Schemes is going to make a turn-based, tactical mech combat game that is steeped in the deadly feudal politics of the classic Battletech setting. Uh, the thing I've always loved about Battletech is the universe, especially the original setting of classic Battletech. I'd like to introduce Mike McCain, creative director of the Shadowrun series. He'll be leading the Battletech game with me. On the battlefield, you'll command a lance of four mechs in turn-based combat, unleashing their awesome firepower and utilizing their mech warrior's unique abilities. Our vision for the game expands in four stages. Stage one is already paid for. It's the skirmish game we're funding ourselves. If our Kickstarter hits funding stage two, we can create a single player story campaign for the game. You'll command your own mercenary outfit, struggling to survive from mission to mission amidst the feudal political turmoil of the deadly 3025 era of the Battletech universe. If we hit funding stage three, we can expand that mercenary campaign to make it much broader and open-ended. So alongside the core story campaign, you'll be able to take contracts from the various noble houses of the Inner Sphere. To make the game open-ended, we'll add a variety of side contracts and procedural mission generation. Funded! Funding stage four adds PvP multiplayer set in the famous arenas of Solaris 7. You'll be able to take your lance to the arena to fight head-to-head with your friends or to compete in ranked leaderboard play. We need your help! So let's work together to bring classic turn-based Battletech back to the PC. Back us!